Hello, and welcome to En Route, A Journey of Faith and Modern Life. I'm Dennis Sanders, your host. I want to say this up front. Thanks for listening. If you have liked what you have heard over the last few episodes, please consider subscribing and subscribe on on whatever podcast platform you listen to, whether that is uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Bullhorn, or any platform. And while you're doing that, also consider leaving a rating or a review. Uh, You can do that on Apple Podcasts, and I think that that is also possible on other platforms. When you leave that that rating or review, you make it a whole lot easier for others to find this podcast. So please, if you can, uh, please do so. Also, Enroot also has a YouTube channel. And you can go to um, check out our show notes for the link. Um, This one thing I'm trying to do, I'm not going to do it with every video, um, but they are um, going to have subtitles, which um, hopefully should be helpful, especially for people who are um, hearing impaired. So check out the link in the show notes and uh, subscribe. Well, Americans have two views on third parties. The first view is that they're going to break up the current political duopoly. The second view is that they're nothing but spoilers. And all they're going to do is help one of the major parties win. That's what people think about third parties in the United States. And there really isn't any middle ground. Now, the U.S. stands alone among major democracies and having just two major political parties. And for many years, that was fine because how the Democrats and Republicans operated were really as two coalitions with smaller parties within them. But over the last few decades, both political parties have become pure. And that means that our politics have become polarized, and that has made it, made it harder and harder to govern. It's also left a lot of people who are once part of either major party on the outs. Pro-life Democrats and moderate Republicans have become rare in our political culture. So could a third party break the logjam? Well, history tells us no. There have been a number of third parties in our nation's history. And to be honest, none of them have really made a dent, or at least made a permanent mark on our political um, landscape. Currently, the Libertarian Party is the third largest party in numbers. But they only have a very small amount of elected office holders. So, Do we just have to accept that these are the parties that we have and to find a way to be comfortable in either camp? Well, William Fleming would say no. Fleming's the head of the Georgia State affiliate of the American Solidarity Party. And what's unique about this party is the ideology that it springs from. The ASP is a Christian democracy party. And for those who are not familiar with it, Christian democracy is not some kind of far-right ideology. Instead, it's an ideology that is grounded in Catholic social teaching and neo-Calvinist thought. What it does is that it takes these teachings and applies them to solutions on issues such as poverty and the environment. There are parties like this throughout the world, with the most well-known being the Christian Democrats in Germany and the Christian Democrats of Chile. The American Solidarity Party is about a decade old, and while it is still very small membership-wise, proportionately they have a growing number of elected officials. In this episode, I talked to William about Christian democracy, how it's different from liberal liberalism and conservatism, and I, we also talk about the mission and future of the ASP. So let us now hear from William Fleming. Well, 
thank you, William, for taking the time uh, to uh, meet with me today. Thank you for having me. Well, I think the first thing that we would want to do is to uh, start by uh, a good definition of what Christian democracy is all about. I think here in the United States, we will, when we think about you know something like Christian Democrats, we are thinking about people who are up from the Democratic Party who are Christians, um, but that's not necessarily what Christian democracy is. Right, Christian democracy is a political ideology um, that originated in Europe, and it uh, predates the Democratic Party by at least a hundred years. <laughs> if you know, so yeah, it's got a little more history, um, but essentially, what Christian democracy is is it is a non-sectarian political ideology um, that draws on the values of both Catholic social teaching and kind of neo-Calvinist thought. Um, so Kuiper was someone who was very influential in terms of developing the ideology of Christian democracy. Uh, he was a politician in the 1800s, I believe, in the Netherlands. Um, and it also draws a lot on some of the papal, papal encyclicals. And it seems to have a lot of strength in um, Europe and also in Latin America. I know that places like Germany um, has a very strong Christian Democratic Party. And then in Latin America, a place like Chile um, also has it. But they, if I um, remember, tend to be, kind of act a little bit different, um, not super different, but there are, are, are differences between the two parties. Yeah, and a lot of those differences, um, as much of them, or as much as they are political differences, um, a lot of those are also cultural differences. Mm -hmm. So the Christian democracy that you see in Europe does tend to be more of a center-right ideology. And in Latin America, it does tend to lean more center-left or even left-wing. Um, a big portion of that in Latin America is due to the influence of liberation theology. And one of the things that I think is nice about Christian democracy is that it is not, it does not um, automatically imply any particular policy position. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are certain policies that are beyond the scope of what is reasonable. Um, but what, what we see is that, you know, there's this core basis of values, and then individuals can, can kind of interpret those values through their own faith traditions and through their own theologies and come to different conclusions about which policy may or may not be the best policy to pursue. And, and all of that is oriented around trying to seek a policy that respects and honors the dignity of the human person. Um, so as long as we, from that framework, I think we're gonna have a lot of common ground to disagree, but to disagree respectfully. Now, one of the things that is um, fascinating about uh, Christian democracy is kind of where it's strong, but also where it's not strong. Um, one of the places that it tends to not be strong is in North America, um, with the exception of, of Mexico. Um, but it seems like in North America, you know, I say it's in Canada, but also I think in the Anglosphere, um, so also the UK and Australia and New Zealand, it's not as has a strong presence. Do you have any guesses as to why that is? My, my guess would, would probably be um, due to cultural influence, um, but I can't say for sure. Um, I do know that there was a short-lived Christian Democratic project in Canada. Um, it was around for maybe 20 years. Um, and they were much more of kind of a typical right-wing nationalist project, um, although they, they did choose to, to identify themselves as Christian Democrats. Um, I, I'm not sure what, what the cause of that is really, but I mean, I don't think that the fact that those areas were heaven, heavily colonized by England can be purely coincidental given you know, the various cultures and countries that, that we do see Christian Democrats, not only, um, uh, not only fighting for office, but actually represented in the parliament, so. 
Okay. So kind of one of the uh, basic questions also would be, what does someone who is a Christian Democrat believe? And, and granted that obviously how that is expressed is, is different and obviously in different places, but what are some of the core, core values? Yeah, so I would say that the, the core values are um, definitely the sanctity of life. Um, you can't really respect the dignity of the person if you don't respect the sanctity of life. Mm -hmm. um, and then the things that flow out of that uh, are social justice, centrality of the family, community-oriented society, um, economic security, care of the environment, and peace and international solidarity. Um, and so we can get into any one of those in particular or as many as you would like through the course of this conversation. Um, but all of those values stem from the dignity of the human person. And so, you know, it, it, if a person is not being respected in their community, if they, if they are not being, if they are not provided with economic security, um, and if we're not being good stewards of both our communities and our world to pass on to future generations, whether that is through environmental destruction or through war, um, you know, there, there is a disconnect there um, in terms of uh, the future. So I think we, can, we can't really say that we respect human dignity if we, if we object to any of those values on a visceral level. And while we've talked about why uh, Christian democracy hasn't really um, blossomed in, in kind of the Anglosphere, here in the United States, there is a, a party that is that espouses to um, follow Christian democracy, and that is the American Solidarity Party. Is there a way, can you tell me a little bit about that party and, and also your role in the party? Yeah, so the, the American Solidarity Party um, is about 10 years old now. We were founded uh, in 2011. And um, over the last 10 years, we've been, we've been growing fairly quickly. Um, we've run two presidential candidates of our own. I believe we did endorse an independent in 2012, right after we were formed. Um, but we have uh, just under 2,000 party members in the country. And we have six or seven elected public officials, which is on a per capita basis is better than any other third party. Um, we may still be small in our membership, but we're growing rapidly and uh, we, we do have fairly good representation on the local level at this point. Um, our first presidential candidate was Mike Matern in 2016, garnered uh, just over 6,000 votes. Mm -hmm. And we ran Brian Carroll in 2020, and he received 42,000 votes. Wow. And so we, we experienced uh, roughly an eightfold increase in a year where most third parties lost votes due to kind of a lot of the consequentialist thinking that was going into how people were voting. Um, so that gave us a lot, of, a lot of hope and a lot to look forward to. And me personally, um, I host the party podcast. I'm involved in a, um, in a side project with some other party members called the American Commons, where we publish commentary on politics, culture, and faith. Um, in a written form. It's a web-based magazine. Uh, and I'm also the chair of the Georgia state, of the state of Georgia for the American Solidarity Party. And where would you sense that the party kind of fits in, in the scheme of our American system? And what, by, what I mean by that is not necessarily where, if they're left or right, but kind of what is their, their niche? Um, what makes them different from the two major parties? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, the left to right dynamic is not one that most people who are involved with us would ascribe to, you know. Um, some, might, some might ascribe to the whole political compass idea, right? Where you have your um, kind of libertarian on the bottom, authoritarian on the top, and then left and right um, on, on the ends there. 
Um, and if you're going to use that kind of a model, we would tend to fall into that upper left quadrant where we we are more socially conservative, um, but we are uh, more left wing economically. Um, so, uh, you know, the the I, I guess I'll explain that one first, because that can be kind of misconstrued um we subscribe to an economic ideology that's known as distributism mm -hmm. um which is a chestertonian kind of experiment um and it's and i probably it, should and you mean gk chesterton gk chesterton okay. correct yes sorry that's okay, um, as, well, that's okay. as well as uh hilaire belloc was another uh writer who talked about this idea and so the concept is that we we absolutely support private property, um, but what we want, what we seek, is we seek an economy in which we have small businesses disproportionately um, represented, and so we do not want to see the vast majority of people working in wage labor positions. We want to see the vast majority of people working as either business owners as sole proprietors or as worker owners as part of a co-op or an ESOP, um, which is a, an employee stock option plan, right? Um, so we want to see uh, an economy where the, the labor is not divorced from the capital. Mm -hmm. And because we feel that that is both more effective in terms of economic decision making, we think that giving that labor a stake in the company will both improve the results of the company as well as improve the drive of the laborer. And we also feel that that is more inherently dignified for the human being. And so there are some people who would hear that and they'll say, oh, you're just capitalists. And there's some people who hear that and they go, oh, you're socialists. And it's like, we're both and we're neither, you know? <laughs> so um, it, it, it uh, I truly see it as a unique position. Others disagree, and that's fine. We don't really need to agree about that. We need to, um, as long as we agree on the ends of, mm -hmm. of that, um, that's, that's totally fine with me. Uh, and we are a more socially conservative party um, in a lot of ways um, due to the fact that we do put a lot of emphasis on the family. We do put a lot of emphasis on life issues. Mm -hmm. um, and the life issues is kind of a double-edged sword. There's some some issues that the Democrats are on the right side on the life issue, like um, you know the death penalty, and there's other issues where the Republicans are on the right side, like abortion, euthanasia, right? Um, but the the family issue I think is an important one because what we see today from a lot of the Democrats who are trying to propose economic welfare programs that that quote unquote support families are really band-aids to bigger problems. Mm -hmm. um, and what we would like to see is we would like to see programs that um, enable people to really kind of take control of the family element. So, you know, the idea of offering universal daycare to, to so that you allow women to go work um, because the reality is we live in a world where you have, you know, two income families are a necessity, right? So we need to, we need to free up the second parent to work. Okay. Well, that's a band-aid, right? How do we empower a couple to decide for themselves if one of them wants to stay home and raise the child, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you, you know, you say, okay, well, they want to, they want to increase the minimum wage. That's a fine, that's a fine idea. It's a fine band-aid. How do we give people an ownership stake in their company so that they can both drive the, help drive the decision making of the company itself and get a return, a greater in turn, greater return on their labor, right? So um, when the people who work at the company own the company, the company is going to treat their employees well. <laughs> you yeah. know, you do, you do not alienate labor from capital when labor owns the capital. Um, and so there we can address a lot of those issues in a more fundamental way without having to resort to any of the quote unquote socialist redistribution mm -hmm. things that become so controversial. 
But yeah, I, I think it, it, it was interesting in talking about things such as um, universal daycare that there has been some talk about, well, well why don't you just you know, give, and this would be something like a child tax credit or, or something that would uh, give people the money to decide for themselves how they want the best to take care of their children, um, whether it's one stay home or, or however, whatever. Um, and it was kind of surprising in talking with some people that giving people that option was just, you could have this kind of look of horror on people's faces. And to me, that makes no sense because I think a lot of people would wanna take some time um, to raise their, their child. Um, whichever partner um, and to to have that freedom and and, and yes some will want to um, put money into daycare but I think that that seems to be a family decision and not a governmental decision yeah and and it's it's interesting because there's a cognitive dissonance there where the idea of paid maternity and paternity leave is part of the platform right? That's that's another component of what they're pushing for. But then when you suggest creating a situation that allows somebody to exit the workforce and raise the child and educate the child, that's that's almost too far. <laughs> you yeah. Know? And, and so I've heard people I've heard people um, within our party who come from a more leftist perspective who actually argue, well, economically, we're to the left of the Democrats, you know. Um, in some ways. Um, and, and so it's, you know, it's so hard using that scale, as we talked about, the left to right uh, dynamic is just insufficient to talk about these issues. But it, it, it is a weird, a weird cognitive dissonance to say, well, we need to give everybody six months of maternity or paternity leave and then once they've used up that six months, then we need to put their kid in daycare so they can go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, I, that's something that I'm not, I don't think I'm ever going to wrap my head around. <laughs> so when you talk about um, employee ownership in, in, of, of companies, two kind of things come to mind. And, and the first would be um, something like a credit union um, in that it's not a public it's not a, a private company, but it is um, instead, it's kind of communal, community owned that everyone who is a member is, has a role in, in um, own a, a state in, in that, um, in the credit union. The other thing that comes to mind is um, in Germany, what they have um, are worker councils where um, the union is very much almost embedded into um, different companies. And, and that you, what you have are these councils where workers and, and labor and capital kind of come together to talk about how to handle various issues and various things. Um, is that kind of what you're getting at when you're talking about company, how companies would be run under, under this, this model? Yeah. So the the idea of credit unions and i think it's important to differentiate between a credit union model and another business that's more of a for-profit business right yeah. a credit union is a non-profit version of a bank yes and it is essentially owned by the members of the union right so the individual account owners are the owners of the credit union and so that's how they can offer lower interest rate loans and lower interest rate financial products. So the employees in that situation don't actually have an ownership stake. Um, they're, they are still reporting to bosses who can you know, have a greater degree of control over their lives and their economic futures. Um, and that's a situation in which I think a German model would work well. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna just be clear and speak strictly for myself at this point, we do not we haven't parsed it out that specifically in our platform, but um, I think that kind of like when you're talking about a situation like a government bureaucratic office that that needs to be run because they're offering an essential service or a nonprofit or a credit union or any other member owned co-op like a credit union, 
Um, I do think that there should be a union that has representation on the board to mm -hmm. steer the conversation of how it's being directed. That's different than when we're talking about a worker co-op. Okay. And so a worker co-op would be um, an organization like uh, some brands that your your listeners might recognize, like King Arthur Flower, okay. or Bob Redmill, um, or even uh, Publix is is uh, they work under an employee stock ownership plan. Okay. Um, and uh, one that's quoted a lot is the Mondragon Corporation in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are companies that are explicit exclusively owned by their workforce, and so. Um, they do not trade publicly for the most part. Some of the ESOPs do, but the worker cooperatives do not trade publicly. And so you, you, in order to own the company, you must work at the company. And so there is no conflict there mm -hmm. between capital and labor because the individuals who are the labor are the ones who own the shares. And so they're making decisions based on what is both in the best interest of the company and the best interest of themselves. You'll often see people who work at these companies in downtimes vote for pay cuts mm -hmm. because they want the company to make it through the rough time. And so they're willing to take a temporary pay cut that they know is temporary, right? Um, and, and they're willing to cut back on their own personal lifestyle because it'll keep the business afloat through a downturn. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a more... Um, integrated uh, kind of relationship and, and it's it's one in which it's not adversarial at all because you don't have competing interests and it also sounds like it's something i mean it actually has been something that has been tried so this is not some oh, kind yeah. of theoretical thing and, and no, no. all these companies that we know are, are already operating under this. Right. Model. Yeah. I mean, in the United States, it's a small number of companies. It's probably about 2000 companies. Um, and <clears throat> many of them are smaller businesses. Although, like I said, there are a few larger ones. I mean, you know, some of these, like the flower company, uh, King Arthur flower is, is everywhere, you know, <laughs> that's everywhere mm -hmm. across the country. Um, and they do, they do well, they compete with these multinational corporations, um, they, it enables them to have a longer term outlook. Mm -hmm. So they're not so fixated on like making next quarter's returns because yeah. they, they know they're playing a long game. Um, so yeah, they, they exist, they compete. And before we had a public stock exchange, this is how all companies functioned. All companies were, you know, were owned by someone who actually labored in them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, you've always had, You've always had some degree of owners and workers, um, but it, it, there, it is a new era in which the you have these individuals who have so much money that they they can't invest it effectively, and they they get into things like venture capital and they mm -hmm. they buy businesses that you know are multi million dollar business and, and uh, just kind of profits from them really um so in the you've kind of talked about the fact that um, the party has been around for about 10 years um it looks like it actually has i mean people in office and that that's that is amazing i think one of the things obviously that people are always going to say about third parties is that they are spoilers and so how would you address that? And how are you able to say you're not just there to spoil um, the party? Yeah, I mean, um, if, I, if that was an individual person speaking to me um, and not an abstract that I'm just trying to justify it, right? Mm -hmm. I would have them talk to our membership. Um, I come from a decidedly leftist background. I wouldn't call myself, I wouldn't say that I was ever a socialist, but I was definitely a Democrat. Um, and there's a lot of people in our party who are former Republicans. We have people who, who have never been part of any major party. They're former Greens or former Libertarians or whatever. We, we pull from, from every corner of the world. Um, and the balance from what I have seen 
is is kind of astounding honestly like you look at the greens and the libertarians and the reason that they're spoilers is because a green if they didn't vote green would never vote republican <laughs> yeah a libertarian if they didn't vote republican would never vote democrat um if asp didn't exist most of our people would vote republican or democrat i couldn't tell you which i mean we'd probably split pretty close down the middle and then there'd be a segment of us who just wouldn't vote. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and that's, uh, we shouldn't take credit for that. I mean, there's no, every third party has a segment of its people who would not vote. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I think that we do represent a greater cross section of the quote unquote left and right um, than most other minor parties. Um, because most other minor parties are firmly in one of those two camps. Mm -hmm. And kind of at this point in the life of the country, obviously both of our, our major political parties are incredibly polarized um, in a way that they haven't been before. Um, there usually had, has been in the past some overlap. So in the past you had um, more liberal Republicans and more conservative Democrats. Um, do you see yourself, do you see the ASP as kind of a, a home for people who have feel that they no longer have a role or place to call home in, in either major party? Absolutely. I mean, that, that is what most of our, most of our people feel. I mean, a lot of our folks were Republicans who were pushed out of the Republican party by Trump. And we have another fairly large contingent like myself who were kind of more social Democrat um, and kind of witnessed the whole situation in 2016 with the Hillary and Bernie primary in the Democratic Party, um, and then witnessed the more recent situation where all of the Democrats simultaneously dropped out to jump behind Joe Biden to defeat Sanders. Um, and somebody, somebody like myself, who is a social Democrat, um is a christian democrat um and for a long time identified as a pro-life democrat mm -hmm. um, i basically felt like the democratic party you know gave me the proverbial finger in mm -hmm. that they said you know uh we're not we we don't care about your your economic priorities and we don't care about your social priorities like we are going to be a corporatist far left socially speaking party right um and so there were there there's a lot of that going on on both sides i can speak to the one side um in more detail than the other because i didn't personally experience that on the on the right obviously um but i think that that's a common experience today where you know somebody is they don't match up perfectly with the ideology um, of the party who who feels that they can for granted and they move to one side of them on some issues and to the other side on the other issues and um, I know a lot of people in our party who are former Republicans mm -hmm. um, who felt that the Republican Party paid lip service to the issue of abortion and when they were actually put in a position to do something about it they chose to put their economic priorities above their social priorities because they knew that by maintaining that social cultural issue as a pinch point that they could continue to incite people to vote for them and that they would hold that audience captive and so there's a lot of people in the party who come from that side of the political aisle who kind of saw through that game and said you know i've just had enough of that well and uh, one of the other things that i was um, of, these, of, of the different values that you were talking about is economic security. And we live in an age, I think, where especially last year as, as the pandemic started, where there were a lot of people who did not, I mean, in, in many ways had the rug pulled out from them. Um, and whatever kind of help that there was available, there wasn't always that much help available um, say for nonprofits that were out there trying to help. What is um, the ASP's vision of what does economic security mean? 
Yeah, economic security to us means that it that you can work one full time job and support a family. Mm -hmm. That is the most basic, quick explanation I can give you. The ideal would be that you have an ownership stake in that business, um, and if if you don't have an ownership stake, you at least have representation amongst the kind of uh, board that's that's leading those those decisions, right? So you either want a um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. And where do you see things or, or issues such as like healthcare? Um, what kind of role, what, I don't know, do you have a, a certain plan or, or ideas of, of how, uh, how that, if that issue matters? Yeah, so um, what our platform states is that we support um, universal healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, we do not spell out exactly how that must be structured. Um, we're not opposed to single payer initiatives. Uh, and we think that single payer initiatives may have a role to play in achieving universal healthcare. Um, but we're, we also value subsidiarity and local control. And so, you know, I, I would say personally that one of the biggest successes in that in, in terms of both healthcare and subsidiarity is the way that Medicaid is run, mm -hmm. where it's a national insurance program, mm -hmm. but it is administered on the state level. And so you have local control over how those funds are dispersed, but you have the, um, the collective power of sourcing those resources from everyone in the country. So that it's not, you know, Mississippi, who's 49th in the nation for income, is funding Mississippi. I mean, that wouldn't work because no. Mississippi is going to have the greatest need. And so, but allowing them to administer the program is going to give them the most effective results because they know what it's like on the ground and the federal government doesn't. So what do you think is the outlook for the ASP in the coming years? I mean, obviously next year is an election year. Um, is there a certain strategy that you have um, in helping maybe to get new members and, and, um, and even for people to, who might be right now in either party to pull the, the lever for the party, even though they may not necessarily join at this point? Yeah, I, our, our strategy for the next cycle is basically to run candidates. Um, we have, I believe at the moment, three or four um, congressional candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if we have any Senate candidates or not off the top of my head, but that that is spread the word. If we can get on the ballot and for a congressional campaign, I mean, the, the congressional districts are seven to 750,000 people. So just having them show up on election day and seeing our name. And then if, if those candidates are able to fundraise effectively, running commercials in the district, buying billboards in the district. So really um, uh, running candidates is one of the best um, forms of advertising in terms of like return on investment um, that, that we have found. So uh, you know, you're obviously going to get more buzz in a presidential year, <laughs> but um, w we think that we can we can continue continue to grow and hopefully, you know, see significant growth again for for 2024. One of the um, issues that you're probably going to deal with in 2024 is, um, especially if you run someone for president, is that people will say you have to, especially if they are. Democrats or and certain Republicans that you need to vote for the for whoever is running for president on a Democratic ticket because if it's uh, Donald Trump again running for the Republicans um, voting for a third party could allow him to win. How do you answer that question? Um, I mean, personally, my response to that would be that your vote is not gonna allow him to win. 
like I think this this idea that that one person is going to be able to swing an election um, is is unrealistic. Maybe ten thousand people can swing an election in one state, um, but for me, I would rather have my vote count by promoting something I believe in, mm -hmm. um, because if the American Solidarity Party gets 50,000 votes instead of 49,000, that makes a greater difference than if the Democratic Party gets 7,596,000 versus 7,595,000, you know. Um, so for me, I think, I think it's about where does my voice have the most impact? Mm -hmm. And I want to promote what I believe in. Um, I know a lot of people don't agree with me on this. I also view my vote as my voice. And I think that if I vote for a person, I am co-signing on what they believe and I am promoting that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I think this guy is worse than that guy, um, that that's not something that I want to just say, okay, well, therefore I approve of the lesser evil. You know, I mean, if you vote like, if you vote for what you don't want and you win, is that, is that better than, you know, not voting? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure it is. So one of the issues that you, you've talked about before is the, the importance of family. Mm -hmm. And um, of course that leads to kind of the issue of abortion. Mm -hmm. And so how does the party um, deal with the, the topic of abortion? Um, is it allowed in certain circumstances? Is it totally um, pro-life all the way? How, how does that work um, for the party? So our aspiration is to make abortion illegal. Mm -hmm. um, that will not be achieved without first making it unthinkable. And so the primary focus should be on empowering women to choose life mm -hmm. and giving them options. Because the irony is that the people don't seek abortions because they feel like they have a choice. The whole movement is called pro-choice. But the vast majority of women who seek abortions do not feel that they have a choice. They are coerced through either material circumstances or through emotional manipulation or relational issues or financial positions or whatever, right? So we need to focus on a two-pronged approach where we pass laws that protect the unborn while simultaneously making life easier for pregnant women. And what do you think about the, the law that has been, well, has been operating and not operating and operating again in Texas? Um, there's, there's been a lot of debate on that internally. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, different members of the party have different opinions on it. Um, what I'll say, what I believe, I believe that just because a law is um, is deemed to be a pro-life law, um, I don't think that that means that we should necessarily defend it at any cost necessary. You know, I don't think that that, um, that, that is a good position to hold. Um, so, you know, I think that you have to actually look at the law. You have to look at the merits of the law and you have to decide based on that. Um, and, and as we discussed earlier, different, different people who subscribe to Christian democracy can have different opinions about those things. And I think, I think that that's fine. Um, but as a party, we do not have an official position on that law um, due to the incredibly uh, specific nature of what's, what's going on there. It's not, it's not a very straightforward situation, so. If you're looking, because I, I know that there are different state um, parties, um, what are some of the, the stronger parties? Yeah, so we have uh, the greatest uh, the greatest number right now are in California, Texas, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. 
Um, that's currently where we're the strongest. Um, now, some of those states obviously have much larger populations than others. Um, so we're hoping to continue that trajectory and continue to grow in those in those places. Um, but yeah, I mean, we ran a gubernatorial candidate uh, in in uh, the California recall election recently, mm -hmm. and uh, he garnered over 5,000 votes um, just in California um, in only a year after, you know, we got 40,000 nationally. So that was that was fairly um, impressive and a good effort from from him. So, uh, you know, I think we are we're strong in those places. We've got a lot of states where we still need to break into, and we've got a lot of states where we're small, but but we've got folks working hard to to build up support in those areas. So, where do you see the party in five or ten years? Um, my hope for five or ten years from now would be that we would be continuing to grow both in terms of raw membership, in terms of vote counts, and in terms of office holders. Um, I think an area that's been neglected by a lot of other third parties is local elected office. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the, the Libertarian Party who has 500,000 registered members, and they hold 200 offices in local and state government. Um, we can do better than that. We have six or seven local elected officials in city councils as mayors on school boards. Um, and we only have 2000 party members. So uh, when you look at those ratios, like that is, that is the path forward. And people often neglect the amount of good that you can do on that level. There are a lot of things that you can do um, as a mayor, in terms of your local city economy. There are a lot of things you can do on a school board to provide alternative education programs for kids struggling with addiction or potentially teen pregnancy and those kind of things. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to get out into, into our own communities, wherever we live, run for office on a local level. And then that also trains those individuals on how to be politicians and how to work in government. And then they can run for higher office. And they're not, you know, just some somebody who has name recognition running on a major third party ticket. Mm -hmm. Right. They're not, you know, somebody like Gary Johnson who ran, ran on the fact that he was a former Republican governor, you know. Um, so I think if we can if we can get people really strongly invested in their communities running for local office, then running for state office, and then potentially running for federal office, you know, ultimately people are gonna vote for you based on what you've done for them in their community, especially if you're not fortunate enough to have a D or an R next to your name, because most people will just vote for whoever has the right letter next to their name. But if you've been an integral part of the community, you know, you're going to win that community. So if someone is heading to an election booth in a year from now or so, um, why should they vote for the ASP? I mean, ultimately, they should only vote for the ASP if they share our values. I mean, I, I'm not... I'm not here to convince anyone to vote for us if they don't believe in what we're trying to build. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they, what they should do is they should look at the website, they should read the platform, they should decide if what we are fighting for is something that represents them. And if they decide that it is, my question is not why should they vote for us, it's why would they vote for anything else? All right. Well, what um, if people are interested in the American Solidarity Party and want to know more? What are some where are some places that they can go to look on the web? Yeah, so they should go to solidarity-party.org. 
Um, that is where they will find information on our statement of principles, on our platform, on our elected officials and our internal party leadership, um, as well as the history of the party. They can read up on that there as well. Um, I host a podcast called The Pelican Brief, um, where I interview both party members and non-party members. We like to bring on people who we share common ground with and who have you know, voices and perspectives that we want to promote. Um, so that would be a great place to, to tune in to learn more. And then, of course, we're on Facebook and Twitter and uh, all of those socials, um, YouTube, so they can come and, and uh, you know, participate in some of the conversation there, uh, watch some of the YouTube videos um, to learn more about, you know, what, what we have going on and what, what some of our members think about various issues. All right. Well, thank you so much, William, for uh, coming on to explain what Christian democracy is all about and to help people learn a little bit more about the American Solidarity Party. Thank you for having me, Dennis. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. taking the time to talk with me. While I consider myself someone that is on the center right, I really don't see myself kind of as a strict conservative. The commentator Jonah Goldberg have, has a good phrase that he's used. It was a phrase that former communist uh, Whitaker Chambers used. He described himself as a man of the right. Since, of course, he came from the left, there were principles that he believed with uh, on conservatism, but he knew that he was different enough that he didn't necessarily, could not use the word conservative. So that fit better for him. And it fits well for me as someone who believes in many principles on the right, but I also have, in some ways, heterodox views that don't make it a for perfect fit for me. I believe in the free market, I believe in limited government and lower taxes when possible. But I also think that government should work in society, especially to help those in need. For the last 20 years, I've admired Christian democracy for its belief in what uh, William Fleming calls the dignity of the person. And that's important. How do we fashion policies? How do we fashion policies at the state, at the, the national level and at the state level that can allow someone, anyone, to live their lives with dignity? I think that's the basic base question for me. And I'm thankful for Christian democracy in that it, can, it reminds us to care for the person before our ideologies. Again, thanks for listening. Make sure to visit the website at andrewpodcast.org. You can find, um, while you're there, to sign up for the newsletter. You can listen to past episodes. You can read some past articles. While you're there, consider making a donation. Your gift, any gift, will help to cover some of the costs associated in the production of this podcast, and it allows me to continue to produce content that's worth a listen. And you can make a donation by going to the Enroot website, which is at enrootpodcast.org backslash donate. That is it for this episode of En Route, Notes on Religion, Politics, and Culture. I'm Dennis Sanders. Take care. Godspeed. And we'll see you again.